The topic I have to present you today is a look back, see the present, and have a look in the future. Minimally invasive spinal surgery was not invented by ourselves. We are on a chain of traditions. When we look back at the tradition, we have precursors. We have an Italian, uh, Domenico Cotugno, who described first in uh, 1764 the ischiatic pain. Malattia di Cotugno was the expression in Italy for nearly 100 years. He, he was uh, then uh, um, structurally uh, um, uh, and, uh, doc documented by Hubert Luschka, who described first time in his uh, uh, paperwork, the half joints of the human body, a kind of uh, disc herniation. At that time, he did not know that it was a herniated disc. He still uh, thought that it was a tumor, a chordroma. In Switzerland, we had then in the early 20s of the last century, the first application of arthroscopy. It was Eugene Berger who made the first 60 patients in the years 21 to 23 and published in 23. At that time, the technology of arthroscopy was not the same as we had today. It was a kind of candlelight that they had available, and it was uh, by far not the same visibility as we have today. It was then Walter Dandy in the United States who described the Coda Equina syndrome due to a herniated disc. He was the probably first that realized the uh, link between neural compression and the clinical signs. It was then the well-known mixture in bar in 34 that uh, invented the uh, treatment by interlaminotomy that went wild, uh, worldwide spread in a few years. In the later 40s, it was uh, Carlos Ottolengi, an Italian working in Argentina, that developed a uh, trigonometric uh, technique for vertebral puncture uh, under X-ray. It was not uh, fluoroscopy available at that time. It was used especially in POTS disease. We had then uh, Lyman Smith, who developed in the early 60s the Chima Papa in applications, the first treatment by uh, intra-body, intervertebral uh, needle technique. It was uh, a very uh, nice uh, idea to condition the disc uh, tissue to shrink. It wasn't a surgical technique, it was a very modern conditioning of the tissue. Due to the same side effects, as you ever know, uh, it was then stopped in the United States in 75 and in European countries in uh, 2003. In the stabilization uh, side, we had the French uh, in the big tradition of uh, invention, inventional uh, procedures. It was Raymond Roy Camille from Paris here that uh, invented the plate stabilization. Also. Uh, a way to approach spinal diseases of uh, disc with instabilities. In 1975, it was Parvis Kambin, the father of uh, American School of uh, Endoscopic Microdiscectomy, that first combined the closed uh, approach that you see uh, uh, on the left side here. You see here the closed uh, decompression, in, still in combination with an open procedure. He called that then, due to the laws in the United States, arthroscopic microdiscectomy, a combination between two legally uh, terms that was accepted also for insurance. He could not uh, use the term discoscopy because in the United States this was not legally registered. In the same period in Japan, uh, Professor Hichikata uh, uh, published his purely percutaneous nucleotidomy it was the first purely percutaneous technique with house open uh, in combination. In the Germany, Wolfhard Kaspar uh, presented then in 77 the microdiscectomy. It was the first time that he could improve the optical vis uh, vision in an open procedure. Uh, it's no question that he made a big uh, step ahead for neurosurgery with this technique. Some other uh, people like Gary Onik then invented a percutaneous uh, uh, technique that allowed to use uh, a surgical application without instruments. It was 
only an automatic nuclear atom uh, introduced in 85. He was, by the way, a radiologist. Then in Switzerland, uh, Suez Ava, uh, 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 assistant of Professor Schreiber, went to, uh, with Professor Schreiber to Kyoto in 78, and they brought back the technique of Ichikata, and they introduced that in uh, Balgrist in Zurich, Switzerland. It was Schreiber then in uh, 84 that first published the inter, uh, intradiscal endoscopic control. So uh, this was the first uh, uh, time that endoscopy with uh, rod lens technique was introduced in the intervertebral disc space. At that time, I joined the group there in 85. Uh, it was uh, a biportal approach uh, that allowed to uh, exp uh, extract the uh, migrated fragment in the posterior disc area. There was also a learning curve there. We had to learn that we must go in the posterior uh, part of the disc in uh, order to really focus uh, on the uh, herniated area and not uh, produce instabilities. So also in these techniques, uh, a learning curve was considerable for the pioneers. In uh, 1985, uh, John Shepard in uh, Hastings in Great Britain published uh, his uh, technique of interbody doweling. It was a combination between uh, intravertebral percutaneous discectomy without endoscopy and uh, bone doweling to restabilize. It was not uh, so successful because the problem was the reabsorption of the bone without stabilization. In the same years, uh, 86, it was then uh, uh, Peter Ascher in uh, Austria who introduced uh, his neodymium Jag laser that was the first that could be used in the lumbar disc. CO2 lasers was introduced in neurosurgery in his uh, technique since the mid 70s. We had also uh, some experience with laser application, excimer, uh, neodymium, holmium. It was a very uh, fascinating time, but we had also some problems with uh, heat uh, accumulation and the effect of the laser therapy in our uh, uh, experience was not better than with mechanical tools. And in Switzerland, we had another problem that the laser was never registered as a medical tool. You could not charge the costs of the laser to the insurances. So this was not possible to continue with this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, tool. Uh, in 88, I introduced then, together with the group at Borgris, the combination between uh, intravertebral disc uh, cleaning with endoscopy and the external fixating device. The, the principle was to distract the segment with the external fixation device and then add also the interbody fusion. We developed some uh, intervertebral uh, milling cutters, as you see here, to clean up and uh, broke, uh, break up the interbody end plates to have a good bed for the fusion uh, that was then uh, done by interbody bone chips from autologous bone. You see here the technique in the table and the end result you see. This is a type of a more than uh, 10 years result. Uh, the, we have a nice fusion and you have very few adjacent le level degeneration. So I think the idea to use a percutaneous fusion has a big impact on the uh, landscape damage you do around. So if you can avoid that, you get probably a help to better avoid, not completely avoid, but better avoid adjacent level uh, degenerations. We had uh, also some limits in our technique. The uh, external fixating device is no more accepted also in Switzerland by the, the people. They don't like to get around for three months with that screws in the back. And the indication was quite narrow because we had at that time no way to clean out the, uh, the channel. So it was a limited indication to spondylolysis in relatively young patients with a good bone. We have switched and also uh, from the external fixating device to the sextant technique that everybody knows that is uh, more elegant and has a good combination also with endoscopic control. Then we have introduced uh, in uh, Bulgaria for the first time in 91 the extradiscal endoscopy that will mean the directly target-oriented endoscopic view in uh, lateral 
uh, herniated disc in the foraminal area. It was the first time that you could approach an endoscopy directly the migrated fragment. We had to learn also the anatomy of the lumbar foramen. You must really spare then the neurological structures there. You were, we must see where you are, that you don't damage these structures like ganglions, uh, things uh, like uh, motoric branches, and so on. This is the uh, approach. It's an oblique uh, posterolateral approach. The fragment is then extracted across the uh, channel, and uh, it's uh, like microsurgery, but with a very minimal uh, approach with a tubular system of about seven millimeters. You can see here the uh, oversee in the oral room. You can really address uh, where the problem is. You can see here the tecal sac and the cleaning uh, underneath the sublegamentary uh, uh, herniation part. We had also some uh, uh, learnings here. Uh, we have the approach more lateral for the foraminal than for intradiscal. We had uh, to avoid the neurological uh, uh, complications. We had to learn also to use the um, high frequency uh, coagulation under water. This was, uh, has been steps ahead in the technology. <clears throat> in the same years, 98, it was uh, our friend Fontanella from Italy that introduced the uh, cervical transiscal anterior coagulal uh, coaxial unipotal endoscopic uh, uh, technique. You see that here. He did hundreds of these cases now in the last years. I always asked him, don't you see collapsing disc after this procedure? He uh, tells me that if it's only one uh, tube that enters, the technique is very safe and no too much uh, long-term uh, collapse. In the same phase uh, in 1999, it was then Jean Destando from France that introduced his uh, tubular system uh, with a conic-shaped tubes, and it was uh, in the posterolateral and the interlaminar uh, approach used. It was the first that you could use in the interlaminar approach. It was not full endoscopic. It was video endoscopic. You, uh, he has in his technique uh, endoscope get, goes down and it's under dry medium, it's under air, it's not under irrigation. But it's a very nice technique, I guess uh, we will see that also more uh, in, during this Congress. It's a uh, minimizing of microdiscectomy with uh, video technique uh, in the uh, controls. In the same times in Japan, Yoshida developed his uh, tubular system that you uh, know the, uh, the different uh, companies that offers them. This is also the same interlaminar approach by uh, minimized uh, micro technique with endoscopy. The full endoscopic uh, interlaminar approach was introduced then by uh, Sebastian Rütten in Germany in uh, 02. A very nice technique that is uh, adapted in the lower lumbar spine quite easily. It's best adapted for free fragment removal. A very nice technique, but also with some learning curve we will see then in the second presentation. Also, some idea to open uh, up the foramens uh, came up with uh, foraminotomy. It was uh, Swiss, uh, Desava in uh, Japan that started in eight, uh, 205. And his technique is quite uh, nice because it's mechanically driven. It's not a laser. With laser, we have seen fractures in the, in the facets uh, when you remove too much bone, and the thermal damage of uh, bone with laser is considerable. In 07, uh, Rutten was then uh, introducing the full endoscopic cervical posterior microdiscectomy technique, a very nice uh, technique uh, which allows to do uh, foraminotomies in a very uh, uh, minimally invasive technique, but also here a big learning curve and uh, he has done hundreds. He's a very handy man. It's not everybody can go and do that like that. The risk you have also to see. When we see the future now uh, uh, that we can see for now, there will be a technological, uh, technological challenge uh, with changing of mechanical uh, tissue elaboration. Maybe some new techniques of jet pulse to tissue elaboration will appear that you can use under endoscopy. Then we have a new technique uh, coming up with uh, chip technique. You can introduce optical chips under irrigation 
with them you can look around the corner, what up today with the uh, uh, rod lens technique is still a little bit difficult. Then we have a big field of selective tissue conditioning. You can use stereotactic uh, techniques with thermal microwave technique or uh, uh, cyber knife techniques. And then you can also uh, make specific cellular conditioning with immunolo immunological tools. So the goal could be that you have a, uh, an activator of the herniated material that you can uh, improve shrinking before removal uh, or even uh, just shrinking by this kind of immunological uh, conditioning. These are the main fields that we see for now. And there is no question that we in, the, in the future we will go from minimal invasive to micro invasive. Then we have another challenge that we have to face uh, uh, when you see the uh, demographic evolution in Switzerland. We have uh, a, a, a minus in the young patient in the next years up to 2030, a little increase in the 20 to uh, 64, a big increase over uh, 63 years, and a very uh, huge increase in the population over 82. So we must face these problems and probably endoscopic techniques must address also the pathology of the older and oldest part of our population in the future. We must see that we can have minimal invasive techniques also to help this growing group in the future to avoid huge surgery which is uh, costly and uh, maybe not available every year. So progress in available diagnostic and therapeutic applications. Can it be available for everybody? Have we the means economically? Have we the availability of the necessary tools for diagnostics? MRI scan in Switzerland you can get within a few days. In Great Britain within weeks or months. Who pays for this increasing availability? Then we uh, will have less invasive operative techniques uh, with micro and endoscopic techniques with shorter hospital stay, uh, but we must develop that. And is that available enough early to uh, avoid collapse of the system? And we think that for do everything uh, in this direction, we need also instruction. So I shortly introduce you to ISMIS. ISMIS was founded in 88 in the Brussels meeting by Hichikata, Schreiber, and Kambin. We had uh, triennial cycles according to the CCOT rules. Our actual president is Dr. Sung Ho Lee. Our upcoming president that will be uh, investigated is Professor Rachenko from uh, uh, Ukraine. We will have uh, the institution then at the Asian Congress in Antalya later this year. We have in Zurich the regular courses since uh, 87. We are now over uh, 30 courses. The last course, we have a special guest lecturer, Gun Choi, we will see him here. And up there you see Professor Hichikata with my wife 25 years ago. The goals and achievements, we try to involve the members to these new techniques. We try to encourage the upcoming generation to join ISMIS and to uh, get uh, uh, instructed. We give the global technic uh, instructional courses. We follow innovations and we have also defined quality standards. In the jungle of this uh, field, there is a need for guidelines. You can see the guidelines that ISMIS has published by help of uh, uh, Professor Birkenmeier, you will see him also here, that tries to coordinate a little bit the activities and set some limits to this kind of uh, techniques and applications. Last but not least, I uh, want to uh, invite you for the next upcoming course in Zurich, Switzerland. It's the 33rd edition uh, in coming January. And I would like also to thank, with our great thanks to, for the excellent job they have done in a very difficult uh, in, uh, environment, uh, to the organizing Paris group led by Dr. Gaston B, to see him on the left, and uh, our friend Frédéric Jacot. I wish you an excellent, uh, excellent and fascinating meeting. Thank you for coming. <laughs>